the oldest unsolved problem in microbiology has been uncultured or as people uh, started calling them at some point, unculturable bacteria. And this has been uh, one of the best uh, kept, uh, the, one of the well-kept secrets in microbiology. Looking around us, uh, we see that bacteria are everywhere. You leave something outside of a container or, or the fridge, uh, it will be covered with uh, slimy growing things, microorganisms, which are ubiquitous and, and they're everywhere. And that gives us an impression that anywhere there is food and a little bit of moisture, bacteria will grow. To the great astonishment of early microbiologists, it turned out the majority of bacteria do not grow in the lab at all. So the typical experiment to show that is you take uh, a sample of soil or marine sediment. You can dilute it, uh, take a droplet, and put that droplet under the microscope and count the number of bacterial cells. Then you take the same droplet, put it on a petri dish, wait for colonies to grow, and count the number of colonies. The difference between the cell count and the colony count is known as the great plate count anomaly. The difference is that you get about 1% of cells that you counted under the microscope to form colonies on the petri dish. And that puzzle existed for about 100 years. Generations of microbiologists tried to solve it by tinkering with the media. Add a little bit more of this, a little bit le less of that. Uh, wait a little bit longer, uh, to hide them in the dark from the sun, uh, whatever. I, I think each and every perturbation was tried with very little, uh, if any, result. And gradually the problem started disappearing as a problem because people came up with a number of imaginative reasons why bacteria do not grow. And one of the reasons, um, which seemed credible uh, at the time, was that the majority of bacteria grow extremely slowly. Maybe they divide once a year. Who would want to work on an organism that divides once a year? You would have to spend 30 years waiting for a colony to show up. Of course, nobody wants to do that. Uh, we are pressed for time. My colleague Slava Epstein from Northeastern University and I have been independently thinking about that problem. Slava is a microbial ecologist. I'm a molecular microbiologist. So we decided to pull our resources together and, and crack the problem. Uh, one thing that we thought may be happening is that the bacteria do not grow in our petri dishes because they ask themselves the question, if you will, where are we? And most bacteria do not like to grow in an unfamiliar environment where they will probably be killed by unfamiliar predators or conditions. And the way they may be recognizing an environment as familiar and committing to division is an environment with correct neighbors, with correct neighboring bacterial species that will produce growth factors for, for them, which will they then recognize. Of course, we have no idea what those growth factors are, so we do not have them in our petri dishes. That was our sort of general theoretical uh, uh, guess or fantasy of what may be happening. Uh, but then, independent of this fantasy, we decided to come up with a method to grow on cultural bacteria, for starters, so that we can inv investigate them. And here we were helped by the principle of ideal solution that we were both uh, using in our, uh, in our practice. So, uh, in the principle of ideal solution, you think about what is this it is ideally that you would like to achieve, and then you worry about technical impl implementation of this idea. So ideally, we knew that bacteria do grow in the natural environment. Of course, they do. So then, ideally, you have to grow them in their natural environment. That's what you need to do. And that sounds very simple. So now we have to come up with a petri dish uh, to grow uh, bacteria in their natural environment. The solution was simple because uh, we are familiar with what is used in biochemistry as a dialysis bag. Uh, it is simply a semi-permeable membrane, which forms a bag. And in that bag, you can put a, uh, a solution of, let's say, your protein with salt, uh, and then small molecules will diffuse out of that bag, and that's how you will uh, free your protein of extra salt. Standard uh, biochemical approach. So we did something very similar. 
uh, a variation on the theme of a dialysis bag, if you will. Uh, we had some semi-permeable membranes and we went uh, to a hardware store and bought uh, an O-ring, uh, which you used you know, to screw on things in, into the wall. So it was a big stainless steel uh, O-ring. And then we took a sample from marine sediment uh, mixed it with agar, diluted, and poured it between these two semi-permeable membranes and glued them onto the O-ring. I must say that nothing worked in the beginning because we used the wrong glue, then we figured out we need to take the glue that is used for aquariums, right, because that's non-toxic, everything else was toxic. The membranes also, once we put this back in the, in the marine sediment, the membranes immediately disappeared because all kind of creatures ate the membranes. So then we realized that we need to take, you know, aluminum or carbon membranes that are going to be resistant to eating by marine creatures. But after we did all those things and put uh, that diffusion chamber back into the natural environment on the marine sediment, we saw uh, a rise of an enormous variety of species. So recovery increased uh, uh, more than 100 times uh, from what was on the Petri dish. And we were very excited about it uh, because it looks like we were closing the Great Plains Count anomaly. It was a, a very simple, very simple study. Uh, it could have been done many years ago, actually. Uh, science published it, uh, and uh, it uh, uh, made a, a bit of a splash at the time when it came out. But the question still remained, uh, why do they not grow uh, on our Petri dishes in the lab? And so we went back to our original idea that maybe uh, these cells require growth factors from their neighbors to know where they are and started testing that hypothesis. And now we were encouraged that we know how to grow uh, these creatures. And we did a very simple experiment. Uh, we reasoned that if the idea is correct, then we can take a heavy inoculum, put it on a Petri dish and let lots and lots of colonies grow. And of course, we assumed that many or most of them would be regular culturable species. But if it so happened that uh, by accident, one of the culturable species was close to a cell which is uncultured and donates a growth factor to it, then that uncultured organism should also form a colony on that crowded Petri dish. And now we can take uh, isolated colonies pairwise, one by one, and streak them together on a separate petri dish, cross streak them. And from that cross streak, what we immediately observed is that one organism would grow whatever we streaked it, and the other one would grow only close to the other one, right? So it was clearly dependent on the other organism, did not grow far away from it on the petri dish. That presented us with what we call a, a bioassay. Right now, we uh, can take uh, the culturable organism, grow it in a flask, uh, sediment it, collect the supernatant, drop a droplet of that supernatant on a petri dish, and that was enough to induce growth of the uncultured organism. So then we can take that liquid, fractionate it using you know HPLC or whatever method, fractionate it, and test each fraction separately for the ability to induce the growth of uncultured bacteria. So that we did and discovered the first class of growth factors for uncultured bacteria. It turned out to be something we did not expect. It turned out to be sidereophores. Uh, sidereophores uh, are iron chelators. So the way uh, bacteria get their iron uh, uh, in most environments is by releasing sidereophores. So iron in nature is present primarily in the form of insoluble iron-3. And then in order to capture iron, you need to solubilize it. So bacteria synthesize sidereophores, complex organic molecules that can grab onto insoluble iron-3. So the cell releases the sidereophore, it goes out, grabs an insoluble iron, brings it back. The cell reduces it into iron-2, which is actually useful to build cytochromes, respiratory chain, other functions. And that's how the cell grows. So what uh, apparently happens in the environment is that, is that the considerable proportion of bacteria lost their ability to make sidereophores and steals them from their neighbors, right? So they steal sidereophores and that is how they grow in nature and of course on our petri dishes now that we know that we can add sidereophores.
to them. So that uh, solves part of the problem, uh, at least part of it. Uh, there are definitely other growth factors uh, that we are hunting. Uh, we are in the midst of finding two more classes of growth factors. We have not published that yet, but uh, probably uh, will soon. How many different types of growth factors there are to be discovered, I do not know, but my suspicion is that that will, is probably what will ultimately uh, close uh, the great plate count anomaly. Is it all about growth factors? That is the question that bothers me. Uh, I don't know whether we found an answer, a principal answer to this problem, and it's really all about growth factors, or there is some other important component that we're missing. So in the marine sediment environment, we estimate that about 10% of all uncultured bacteria can be brought back to growth by adding siderophores. 10% of the total 99, right? The other class of growth factors that we are looking at now explains less than 10%. And my suspicion is that maybe as we go down that road, the third, uh, the fourth, and the fifth class will uh, each explain a small part of the total diversity. And there may be another big component, which is not necessarily growth factors from neighboring organisms that we're missing. Uh, and that is a puzzle that maybe requires a different solution. Of course, understanding uncultured bacteria is enormously significant because the majority of all species on this planet uh, are bacteria. They're responsible for uh, geochemical cycles uh, of element. They're responsible largely for the well-being of the biosphere. Uh, and the fact that the vast majority of them have not been cultured and were not accessible to study in the lab has been an enormous barrier uh, to progress. So th that would be one of the tangible results uh, of such studies is to bring creatures that we could not study in the lab uh, into the realm of science where we can study them. Another very important aspect of uncultured organisms is the fact that our symbionts are primarily uncultured. Uh, so for the last, I would say, five years, there's been an explosion in the studies of what is now known as the microbiome, the collection of all microorganisms that live in people, primarily in the gut. Uh, there are more cells of bacteria in our gut than are cells uh, of human cells in the human body. So in a way, we are kind of a chimeric organism, if you will, or superorganism. Uh, very many of those species are symbionts, do very useful things for us, help us digest certain things, uh, help us uh, keep down inflammation, keep pathogens at bay, uh, affect almost e each and every function uh, of the human body. And uh, the majority of those organisms are, have, have not been cultured. So, of course, uh, that has presented a big impediment to progress in that field. And once we close that anomaly gap, we'll have a better handle uh, on, our, on our symbionts.